Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the uh, the Beacon Church this Sunday morning. It's uh, it's great to see you all out, and we do welcome you, especially if you're visiting us this morning. It's good to see people back from holiday, and I do hope that you've had a, a lovely time wherever you've been. And as I said last week, uh, when people come back, there's others going off on holiday. Uh, we also welcome uh, people if you're joining us on, on Zoom or catching up with us on, on YouTube. And our prayer is that we'll know God's presence with us as we worship him together. It's great to see Simon and Josiah and, uh, and Bethan and the boys back from their week on, on Beach Mission. James has, has gone from Ben Lech and is now in Lou uh, and is starting another week, uh, this time with a, a, a new team in, in Lou, so we can, we can pray for James and the team. <clears throat> this morning, we're continuing our series, Seeing Jesus, looking at the signs of Jesus as recorded in the Gospel of John. And today, our speaker is uh, our pastor, Anthony, and he will be taking us through John chapter 9, where Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And his title today is New Sight. So in a moment, I'm going to open our time in prayer, and then we're going to sing our first song, uh, after which uh, Jennifer Harrison will bring us our Bible reading, uh, and that is John chapter 9, verses 1 to 25, and then Anthony will speak to us. Uh, after that, we'll sing again, and we'll be joined by our children from Kids Church. So first of all, let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, we do so to worship you, for you are worthy of our prayers. We thank you that you are a God who loves us with a love that will never fail, a love that will never let us go. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you for your word, and we pray that you will speak to us through it this morning as Anthony speaks. We ask that you will open our eyes this morning to see you and to open our ears to hear what you want to teach us. We pray for those who are on holiday at the moment. We ask that you give them a time of refreshment, keep them safe, safe as they travel, and may they return to us to enjoy fellowship again soon. We pray for James and his team on the beaches in Lou. Bless them and may they see your hand at work as they spread the good news of the gospel. We pray for those of our number who are struggling at the moment, be it because of health concerns or other issues that weigh them down. Be near to them. May they know your hand upon them and your presence with them, whatever they're going through. Bless our children in Kids Church. They are a joy to us and they are a gift from you. We ask that you reveal yourself to them as they hear stories about you each week. So, Lord, bless our time together. May all that we do this morning bring glory to your holy name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing, and then Jennifer will bring us our Bible reading. So
The reading, uh, oh, not right in here. the reading is uh, John 9, 1 to 25. As he went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one who you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why the parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very grateful to, to Jennifer reading that uh, passage for us and to, to Glyn for leading our time together. It's great to gather like this and uh, welcome again, whether you're here in the building or joining online or watching afterwards. Any visitors among us, uh, particularly if it's your first time, it's lovely to have you with us and hope you feel at home with us here at the, at the Beacon Church. If you don't know me, my name is, uh, my name is Anthony. Well, in these, uh, in these uh, weeks over the summer holiday period, we've been looking at some passages in John's Gospel under this overall title of Seeing Jesus. And uh, we're not doing this just to fill the time during the holiday. We're doing this because it's really important for us to continue to put the focus on Jesus. What we need as Christians and as a church is constantly to come back to Jesus, the Jesus of history, who meets us in the pages of the Bible to see who he is 
and what it might mean for us to trust ourselves to him. And as we've seen, that's why John wrote his gospel in the first place. Towards the end of his book, we read these words. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So signs is the word that John uses for miracles, signs which uh, point to who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. And John says that he wants his readers, it's you and me, to see the signs that Jesus did and believe in Jesus and receive the life that he brings. And that's why actually the immediate context of these verses in John chapter 20 is really important. It concerns Thomas, you might recall, the disciple, and uh, a conversation that he has with Jesus about sight and faith. Because after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus meets with the disciples, as you might remember, but Thomas isn't there with them. And when the other disciples tell Thomas that they've seen Jesus, he, of course, doesn't believe them. And so he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I need to see in order to believe. Well, of course, the very next week, Jesus appears again to the disciples when Thomas is with them. And Jesus invites Thomas to do just that. Not sure whether I would. Don't actually know if uh, Thomas did actually take up Jesus on that offer. But what we do know is that Thomas called Jesus his Lord and his God. But then Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then he goes on to say, that's why I've written this gospel. That's why I've recorded these signs. So that you folk who haven't seen Jesus with the eyes in your head might be able to see Jesus with the eyes of your heart. That is us, of course. Those who believe in Jesus, even though we've not seen him. Jesus did lots of signs, says John, and I've selected just a few of them. So that you might be able to see Jesus for yourselves. Believe in him as the Messiah and Son of God and have life in his name. And so these signs that Jesus does that are recorded for us in John's Gospel are really important. Just as a little reminder, the ones we've looked at so far, Jesus turns Jewish cleansing water into new wine to show the blessings that will come about through his death when his hour eventually comes. He heals a, a royal official's son from a distance to show the new power that he has over sickness and the importance of us giving up our claims on him in favor of the claim that he makes on us. As you saw a few weeks ago, he heals a man who's been unable to walk for 38 years to show the new authority he has as God's son, who's able to bring life just as his father brings life. And then last week with Mark, we saw how he feeds a multitude with a few small loaves to show the new provision that he brings to the world as the bread of life who gives his life for the world. And today we'll see how he brings new sight to those who would otherwise be unable to see, who would otherwise be left in blindness. And perhaps this sign, the one that Jennifer read to us, this sign of all of them shows us most clearly what it means to be able to see Jesus for ourselves. Now, those of you of a certain age uh, will remember these uh, magic eye picture books. They were very popular um, some decades back. I'm getting nods from people of a certain age. Um, the book, uh, these books contained uh, uh, pictures of colored dots and swirls and patterns and just to say to the teenagers among us, this is how your mum and dad used to entertain themselves <laughs> in the 90s. Um, but if you looked at a picture, there's one of them, if you looked at a picture in a certain way or squinted in a certain way, then you suddenly saw 
Well, here's the thing. I never found out what you saw because <laughs> I could never do it. I could never do it. I'm really hoping there's nothing rude in that picture there because <laughs> I haven't the faintest idea what's there. But apparently you could see pictures. My mum was amazing with them. She, would just, she could just glance at them and say, oh, yes, a beautiful cottage in the countryside with a lake shimmering in the background and sheep grazing in the hills. And I would say, you what? For me, it was never more than, you know, colored dots on a piece of paper. Some people could see it and some couldn't see it. And in today's passage, we have a story of people who can see and people who can't see. And what makes the difference is Jesus. But before we look at the story itself, I just want us to back up a bit. Last week we were in chapter 6, uh, looking at the feeding of the multitudes. Today we're in chapter 9, uh, looking at the healing of the man born blind. But what lies between in chapter 7 and 8 is really important because they provide the setting for this miracle. And that's the first thing I want us to think about this morning, the setting. You might have noticed that John is very interested in the Jewish feasts. And quite a bit of the action in his gospel takes place during the festivals in Jerusalem. So in chapter 6, for instance, it's Passover time. Now, Passover, as you might remember, the people looked back to the time when God delivered them out of Egypt. And giving bread was part of the package on that occasion. So in chapter 6, what's happening for those with eyes to see, to see where the sign is pointing, is that Jesus multiplies a few loaves, and Israel is being fed in the wilderness all over again. Not by Moses, of course, but by one who is himself the bread of life, the one who brings to completion all that that feast of Passover looked forward to. But then at the start of chapter 7, Jesus goes to Jerusalem for another feast, and this time it's the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, what was Tabernacles all about? Well, Tabernacles simply means tents. And the feast reminded the people of their years of wandering in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt, when they lived in tents. And so for seven days during this feast, they would set up tents or makeshift shelters. and They would live in tents for a week, like some kind of you know, Greenbelt Festival or some kind of festival, and uh, as a little reminder of what their ancestors, how their ancestors lived. And it was an, it was an annual reminder of, of when God was faithful to them during that period. During that time, we know that God provided water for them, and God provided light for them, water and light. And both those gifts were celebrated during the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, with that in mind, let's have a little look back at John 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now, the feast that's mentioned there is Tabernacles. We know that every morning during the feast, there was a, a pr procession to a, a fountain which supplied water for the pool of Siloam. And here the priest would, would fill a pitcher with, uh, with water, and then the crowd would make its way to the temple, singing and waving branches. And the priest would go to the altar at the time of sacrifice and would pour out the water. Now, that looked back as a reminder to the time when God provided for them in the wilderness. But it also looked forward to the future age of blessing. It's described in Ezekiel chapter 47, where a stream of water would flow out of the temple and would, would stream out and bring blessing to the whole land. So you've got this water-pouring ceremony going on during tabernacles. And it may well have been, I think we're meant to understand, that just at that very moment as they were pouring the water, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus shouted these words, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. What's Jesus doing? He's saying, isn't he, that he is the fulfillment 
of all that the Feast of Tabernacles looked back to, but also looked forward to. He is the one who can provide the waters that they're longing for. Are you thirsty? Come to me and drink, says Jesus. And that's an offer that Jesus still makes to us today. But if Jesus makes that claim about water, he also makes that claim about light as well. And light was also significant for the Feast of Tabernacles. During Tabernacles, lamps were set up in the, the temple. And they're picturing the, the pillar of fire which led the people through the wilderness. And again, it's in that context that Jesus says in chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And in case we miss it, he says the same thing again in chapter 9, verse 5. Now again, what's Jesus doing? Well, he's claiming that he is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, both in the water that he supplies, come to me if you're thirsty, but also in the light that he brings, I am the light of the world. So just as I am the bread of life is significant for those celebrating Passover, so I am the light of the world is significant for those celebrating tabernacles. So that's the setting. As we come into chapter 9, that's the setting that we've got to imagine ourselves in. Tabernacles, lights being lit in the temple, looking back to this reminder of how God provided light for the people in the wilderness and so on. We've got another feast and we've got another claim. So with that in mind, let's have a little look at the, the sign itself. Now, in chapter 6, Jesus shows by the, the feeding of the multitude that he's the bread of life. And now he shows he's the light of the world by healing this man born blind. We just remind ourselves of the, the story. It begins with the healing. And the healing is described actually quite briefly in verses 1 to 7. The disciples are looking for a theological debate about the cause of the man's suffering. Did he sin or his parents that he's been born blind? But Jesus is looking for how God's work might be displayed in the man. And so in a way that reminds us of how God creates Adam in Genesis chapter 2, Jesus spits on the ground, he makes clay for the man's eyes, and then sends him off to this pool, which also means sent, where he is to wash himself. And when he does so, he can see. How amazing would that have been? But we still got 34 verses left in this chapter. <laughs> and what follows the healing is what we might think of as the hearing. And it might be helpful to think of this. I wonder if you thought of this as Jennifer was reading it. To think of this as a sort of trial where we have this, this whole series of interrogations between different sets of people. I'm just going to race through them because it's a long chapter. We can't look at it in detail, but we can get the overall flow. Because we begin with the man and his neighbors in verses 8 to 12. And they're the first people to respond to the healing of the man uh, born blind. They'd seen the man begging every day of his life. And now they're amazed that he could see. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? But actually, they seem to be more interested in the, in the mechanics of the healing rather than the meaning of the healing. How were your eyes opened, they asked. And the man gives a very concise witness statement of what happened. He did this and this, and then I could see. And then we have the man and the Pharisees in verses 13 to 17. The neighbors wanted to know how the healing was done. The Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, are more concerned it's been done on the Sabbath, the Jewish holy day, when work wasn't allowed. And so they quiz the man, and the man confesses Jesus to be a prophet. And then we have the Pharisees and the man's parents in verses 18 to 23. Because the Pharisees now summoned the man's parents into the dock in this, in this court. And they're a bit cagey. 
not, maybe not the best example of parents. Yes, yes, he is our son, but they're very nervous about being thrown out of the synagogue, about being ostracized in the community. So they basically say, well, he's, he's of age, ask him. Thanks very much, Mum and Dad. <laughs> so the, the Pharisees do. And so we come back to the man and the Pharisees in verses 24 to 34. And now there really comes the Inquisition, which no one expects. But there we go. The man's, yeah, again, you have to be of a certain age to understand that. The man's back in the dock, and they're throwing their questions and their accusations at him. But I wonder, did you get the sense of just the amazing spirit that this man shows? So the last verse that Jennifer read for us, verse 25. The one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I can't answer all your questions, but I was once in the dark, and now have come into the light. So they say, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And as we read on in the story from where Jennifer uh, finished, we read in verse 27, I've told you already and you did not listen. What, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And I wonder if we're meant to understand that he gets a little bit sarky with them here. You theological bigwigs who know everything, all those letters after your name and all those theolo theology books that you've got in that big pile, and you don't know who he is, do you want to follow him too? And what we see as this story goes on is that the proud Pharisees cling to their pedigree, which they thought went back to Moses, but they wanted nothing to do with Jesus. They had no idea where Jesus came from. That's what they say. We have no idea where this man came from. But the man knows. The man himself says in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. He gives his testimony. And so then we come to the man in Jesus, in verses 35 to 38. And this is one of those beautiful, precious, private conversations that we see Jesus having sometimes in John's gospel. The Pharisees are throwing the man out of the synagogue. But Jesus finds him. Now remember, the man hasn't seen Jesus before this moment. His sight hadn't been restored until he washed himself. And by that time, Jesus was gone. He doesn't know what Jesus looks like. But now Jesus seeks him out, as, as Jesus does. And he comes to see Jesus for who he really is and believes in him. And so we read, if you've got the passage open, we read in verse 38, then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. So he responds immediately and decisively, not by asking how it had been done, but by believing in Jesus and worshipping him. And then we finish with the Pharisees and Jesus in verses 39 to 41. And the chapter turns... Uh, or ends, rather, with Jesus turning the tables on those who've been conducting the hearings, the Pharisees who've been asking all the questions so far. And what Jesus does in these final verses, as I, I hope we'll see in a moment, is he puts them on trial. He declares them guilty. And it's, it's difficult to miss the irony, isn't it, in the different responses to this sign. Every person who had physical sight, the neighbors, the parents, the Pharisees, couldn't see Jesus for who he was as the Son of God. The only one who could see him truly was a man known for being blind. And part of the point of all this back and forth that John goes into great detail about is that it allows us, in fact, it forces us to be drawn into what's, what's going on here. What do, what do we make of it all? Who will we side with? What do we think about who this person Jesus is? So just to recap, we've looked at the setting. It's another feast, not just Passover, but tabernacles too. It's another claim, not just about bread, but now about water and about light. And we've looked at the sign where the healing itself is told briefly, but where that is followed by this back and forth hearing with different characters 
So let's say something finally about the significance. Now, as I hope we've seen in this series, the, th the thing about the signs in John's Gospel is they point away from themselves. They are signs which have significance. And that's what signs do, as we've, as we've seen a few times in this series. Signs point somewhere else. So what are some of the significances of this one? Well, I've got three things to, to share with us this morning that I think flow out of this sign. First of all, the importance of light. The importance of light. I wonder, as I've reflected on it in my preparation for this, whether it's become too easy for me to take light for granted. Uh, perhaps that's the case for, for you too. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where it's just been totally dark, no light at all. You've, you've had nothing to be able to get rid of that darkness. And just how, how difficult and oppressive that, that can be. Now, even I, um, you know, I can remember growing up in Liverpool in the 1960s and 70s when power cuts happened fairly regularly when my mum had to fumble around in the dark looking for, for candles. Uh, I regularly remember reading in my bedroom by candlelight, and one time actually setting fire to my pyjamas. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a different story. Of course, there are lots of places in the world with no electricity today or a poor supply of electricity where when it's dark, it's dark, you know, until the morning comes. It's only when we feel the power of darkness that we really appreciate the importance of light. Light, is, as you might know, is, a, is an important theme for John in, in his gospel as well. He begins with it in chapter 1. He speaks about Jesus as the word of God. And he says that in the word was life, and that life was the light of the human race. And John says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness hasn't mastered it. And then in chapter 3, John tells us that some people walk in darkness because they don't want to come into the light. John makes it clear to us that to live a life without Christ is, is essentially to, to live in darkness. It's as if you're blind. You just can't see. But there's good news. <laughs> there's good news. Because if the world is in darkness and if people stand under judgment, Jesus comes and he says, I am the light of the world. And the beautiful thing is that he, he shines his light into our darkness. brings light and life to all who will believe. So the sign speaks to us about the importance of light. But it also speaks to us about the necessity of faith, of belief, if you like, in Jesus. Now, as we've seen towards the end of this chapter, when Jesus hears that the man has been thrown out of the synagogue, he finds the man and asks him if he believes. Does he believe in the Son of Man? And then as we've seen in verse 38, the man confesses, Lord, I believe, and worships Jesus. Again, it's, it's helpful, I think, for us to clock what's going on here. He's been thrown out of the synagogue, so he's effectively lost his place of worship. But Jesus meets him and restores his worship. Not just by giving him physical sight, but giving him spiritual sight to match his physical sight. The man not only believes, but worships the one who is the light of the world. Which, of course, seems like the most appropriate response to the one who opens our blind eyes. 
I wonder if you remember, if you were here a few weeks ago when we looked at the man in chapter 5. And uh, basically that man, you know, Jesus meets that man again after he's, after he's healed him. He's been able, unable to walk. And uh, the man basically shops Jesus to the Pharisees. Do you remember? And then we, we don't hear anything more about him. There's a real contrast with the man in this chapter. And we can perhaps see that even in the course of the chapter, he's on a mini journey of faith. So in verse 11, he refers to Jesus as the man they call Jesus. In verse 17, he calls Jesus a prophet. A prophet, of course, was a, a spokesperson of God. In verse 33, he says Jesus is from God. And then in verse 38, he believes and worships Jesus. Remember, that's why John wrote his gospel. So that people like you and me might be able to see Jesus for ourselves. But more than that, not just see, to believe in Jesus. And to have the life that Jesus brings. And through his gospel, John provides a way for people like us to see and believe that the life-giving Messiah and Son of God is none other than Jesus. And once again, I think we have that question from John this morning. Do we believe in Jesus? And more than that, actually, from this passage, do we worship Jesus? Where might we be this morning in our relationship with Jesus? A man called Jesus? Prophet? Good man? Yeah, he's from God. Or is he the one for whom we don't just believe but want to give our lives to in service and worship? How grateful are we for our opened eyes? But there's a dark side to this, too. We saw this dark side in, back in chapter 5 as well, but it's here in chapter 9 as well, because there's also the danger of judgment. Uh, the chapter begins with a, a question about judgment in verse 2. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was, he was born blind? It's a question about judgment. And the chapter ends with a statement about judgment in verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see... And those who see will become blind. And the Pharisees go on to ask, are we also blind? Now, they're assuming, of course, that they're not blind. But Jesus says that while the blind man has been brought to sight, ironically, they're the ones who are in the dark. They're the real blind ones. And although they're the ones who've been doing the judging in this trial... Jesus makes it clear that they're the ones who are going to be judged. The man knew himself to be blind and in need of sight, whereas the Pharisees, though spiritually blind, claimed to be able to see. A little bit like me with those magic pictures that I could never see. I'd sometimes think people were having a massive joke on me. <laughs> I can see fine. So there really can't be anything there to see, can there? And what we pick up from the debate that goes on in this chapter is that often when people reject Jesus, it's not a matter of their intellect or even actually their, their religiosity. It can just be just their sheer will. It's not that they can't believe, it's that they won't believe or they don't want to believe. Pharisees weren't really wanting to find out who Jesus was. They were just looking for enough rope to hang him with. Why does John record these signs of Jesus? So that we might believe and go on believing. But they're double-edged, and I think we have to acknowledge that. They draw some people in, and they drive others away. The light attracts some, but repels others. 
We sometimes imagine that if only people could hear the good news, they'd understand and believe in Jesus, but they wouldn't necessarily do that. Many of us will have friends or colleagues or family members who know, know all about Jesus, but don't believe. And we can, we can be sad about that, but we can't necessarily be surprised. The Bible tells us that our natural inclination is to reject God. Our default is blindness. As human beings, that's where we are. We're as blind spiritually as this man was blind physically. It's only Jesus, the light of the world, who can do something about that. And the passage ends by reminding us that those who don't believe, who reject the light, remain in their guilt. And so Jesus says in verse 41, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim to see, your guilt remains. And those are serious words. But their very seriousness, I hope, just drives us back to Jesus. Drives us back to Jesus again. To, to the only one who can give us this new sight that we so desperately need. And to believe in him. And then to worship him with all our heart. So Jesus warns about rejection, yes. But he also invites us to put our faith in him and we can do so because he's the one the only one who can open our eyes and bring us light and let's pray before we sing lord jesus thank you that you truly are the light of the world thank you for your promise that whoever follows you will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life please help those of us who might be teetering on, on the brink of putting our trust in you, knowing, uh, knowing, Lord, that doing so will not only save us from judgment, but give us new life and new purpose in following you, the light of the world. It may be the testimony of each one of us here this morning that whatever else we might know, we were blind, but now we see. And help those of us who are seeking to follow you, to do so from a heart which not only believes, but which worships. Thank you, Jesus, light of the world.
Well, I'm so grateful to, uh, to the musicians for leading us in, uh, in our sun worship this morning. Thank you, guys. Uh, welcome uh, those who've been in uh, Kids Church. Um, it's great to see you. Hope you're hope you're keeping well. I know that we're still in the summer holidays at the moment, but while we're while we're all together as a church family, I want to share with us two things uh, that will be happening in church next term. But first of all, I'd, I'd like to ask us uh, I'd like to ask us a question. When you think about the future, what do you hope for? I'm particularly interested in some of the younger ones maybe responding to this. When you think about the future, what do you hope for? Any thoughts on that? Might take a little bit of a while. Ezra, have you got any thoughts? What do you hope for? I want to be in the future. I miss that. A, I want to be in the future. A YouTuber. <laughs> what a great aspiration. I'm sure your parents must be. <laughs> I mean, I'm a different generation, so, but I think that's fantastic. You'll make your millions, son, and you'll keep your parents, and everyone will be delighted. Remember us when you come into your kingdom. Okay. A YouTuber, great. Someone else. Doesn't have to be that high an aspiration. So, someone else? Yeah. Ah, oh, fantastic. You'd like to be a police dog handler. That, that sounds pretty cool. Now, is that because you're interested in the police or you like dogs? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good thing, yeah. Not that being a YouTuber is not a good thing. I think that's a great thing as well. Anyone else? What do you hope for? Anyone else? An adult? Okay, the voice of the mother speaks. <laughs> you may have your hopes, but they have to go through your parents. Yes. Well, those are, those are some brilliant answers. I love hearing those. You know, as human beings, we are hope-shaped creatures. That means we look forward to things. Hope is about wanting something more than we have right now or that we can see right now. We all live with that sense of hope, even if it's just for the next holiday or the next weekend. Well, the first thing to tell us about for next term is that we're going to run a short series over three Sunday evenings called Hope Explored. This is where you all go, Ooh. thank you. Hope Explored is a, it's a great resource uh, which uses a combination of videos and discussion to help open up the, the significance of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and how Jesus can bring real hope to people today. You see, the things that you hope for and I hope for, they might not ho happen. I hope that Liverpool will win the Premier League this year. I'm sorry about that. I know that's, that upsets some of you. Some of you hope that they won't. But none of us know for sure at this point in the season. But true hope is about being certain that something is going to happen in the future and looking forward to it. And that's what this, this program, Hope Explored, is all about. So we've got a trailer for it here, if Simon's happy to, uh, to show it for us. Some of us will have seen this before, but it's quite short and it gives us just a little flavour of what to expect. Thanks, Simon. So I'm inviting us to, to, to clock this down. We're going to be doing these three sessions 
on the Sunday evenings of the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th of September. So it starts a month from now, and it's just three evenings. And I want to encourage you to come if you can, because there are all sorts of people who will benefit from coming along. If you're exploring the Christian faith for yourself, this is a great opportunity to take that further in conversation with others. If you've been a Christian for a while, but perhaps you feel a little bit stale in your faith, this is a great opportunity to be refreshed in the basics of, of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. If you're a Christian who'd like to grow more confident in telling others about Jesus, this is a great opportunity to pick up ways in to those conversations about what it means to have real hope and real purpose in life. If you're a Christian who has a friend or friends that you've already been talking to about these things, this is a great opportunity to invite them to come along and to do the program with you. But also because we rerun this course at other times, this is a great opportunity. If you're unsure as to what it's like, come along, try it out for yourself so that you can see what it's like with a view then to inviting someone at some point in the future. So let me encourage you to give it some thought and put those dates in your calendar, the 15th, 22nd, 29th of September, and try to come along on those evenings. If you'd like any more information, please speak to uh, Janet Tate or, or Sue Hayes. So just give, give us a wave, Janet, Sue at the back. So if you need any more information, do, do, do speak to uh, Janet or, or Sue. So that's Hope Explore. That's the first thing that's happening next term. The second thing that's happening next term is on the 6th of October, we're going to have a baptism service. Whoa. Thank you. As you know, as a church, we, um, we understand from the Bible that when people come to faith in Jesus, one of the ways that they show that faith is by being baptized, by being plunged under water for a short while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then coming out of, uh, coming out of the, the water. I can't remember the line that Glenn used last week. What was the line that you used last week? If you want to take the plunge. If you want to take the plunge. It's, it's, a, it's a great way of showing that we've, we've died to our old self and we've been raised to our new self with Jesus. It's a really special and significant thing for a Christian to do. So if you're a Christian and you've not been baptized this way, the 6th of October, not too far away, this might be the moment for, uh, for you to do so. We know from the Bible that being baptized is, is an act of obedience. We're baptized because Jesus commands us to, to be so. We're baptized as an act of confession to declare publicly that we belong to Jesus and to show what God has done for us. And we're baptized as well as an act of dedication to show our desire to follow Jesus. So baptism may well be something that you've been thinking about for a while, or perhaps you're hearing about it for the first time now. Either way, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to know more, please uh, speak with me. I'd love to chat with you. Um, or have a chat with someone who's baptized, already baptized. Uh, maybe one of those who was baptized a few years ago, Adam and uh, Carrie, and Katie, Nicole and uh, Ollie. Have a chat with one of those, and they'll be able to, to tell you all about it. So let's pray about these things uh, before Glyn comes and does the notices for us. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for, for our church family. Thank you for the way that you have looked after us here at the Beacon Church. And we pray, Lord, for this Hope Explored course that we're planning to do. We ask that it be a great moment to be encouraged about what it means to have real hope because of what Jesus has done for us. And pray, pray, Lord, as well for our planned baptism service. Lord, we thank you for this reminder that it brings of what you've done for us in giving us new life to those who belong to the Lord Jesus. And Father God, we look forward to all that you have in store for us as we seek to carry on being faithful to your calling on us as a church, as a people in this place. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, we've got just a, a few notices be, uh, before we finish. Uh, Asia Link will be hosting an event here at the Beacon as part of the 25th 
anniversary celebrations, and that's on uh, the evening of Thursday, the 10th of October. Um, part of that will, uh, will, uh, will include some of the partners uh, who will be present and, uh, and who we'll be able to, to hear from and chat to, one of who will, uh, will be Bishnu that we've heard um, lots about uh, through John. Uh, Bishnu is from Nepal. I had the privilege to visit uh, Bishnu in Nepal with John and he took us to his house and, and we had a meal with him and his, his family and we had a, a, wonderful, a, a wonderful time together and he really is a man with a, with a, a heart for the lost. So it'd be, uh, it's going to be a, a great evening. Uh, it's an all-ticket event and the tickets are free. Uh, they are available online or you can put your name on uh, a, a sheet which is at the front here uh, and John will sort those tickets out for you. So that's Thursday the 10th of October. Uh, on the week commencing the 26th of August, that's the bank holiday week, um, Alan is going to be polishing the, sh the church floors and doing a few other little jobs in here and uh, in St. Luke's. Uh, if you're able um, uh, at all that week, please speak to, to Alan. It, um, it could do with a, a bit of help. So that's the week uh, commencing the 26th of August. That polishing the floors always reminds me of school. In the summer holidays, you'd go back and there was that smell of the, of the polish on the gym floor, wasn't there? You know, it always reminds me of that. Um, uh, the midweek get-together this week is at, uh, is at K and my house uh, this Wednesday. That's uh, from 7.30. Uh, and if you need details of, of the address, just uh, speak to me after the service. Okay, well, I think that's, uh, that's enough for this week. We've got one final song, and then I'll close in prayer. So.
is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever forever Lord we thank you for meeting with us this morning we pray that you will indeed open our eyes to see you open our ears to hear you and open our hearts to accept you may we keep you in the center of all that we do give us a desire to know you more and open our mouths so that we can share our faith when opportunities arise we ask this in your precious name amen